We are going to start. All right, and we'll get started. Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. I'm really excited to jump right in. We have such a great panel of teachers that we are going to hear from and learn from tonight. I'll just say, if you have questions during this conversation, feel free to ask them in that Q&A box. You can see the chat feature and then that Q&A feature. Pop your questions at any time during that Q&A um, in that Q&A box. We are going to spend some time at the end answering all of your questions. I also want to add that if you would like to follow up one on one, my email is going to be on the last slide. Please reach out and we can discuss your particular situation, either via email or if you want to schedule a phone call with me, I'd love to talk to you and answer any questions that way as well. We are going to start by just doing some quick introductions. My name is Juliana. I'm the recruitment manager. Many of you have probably heard from me either on the phone or through email or through text. Um, it's really nice to virtually meet all of you. I'm a former teacher and I am passionate about bringing diverse and effective teachers into the classroom. I am in New York City right now and I'm really excited to be here tonight. I am going to let the other panelists introduce themselves. I'll pass it over to Shanita to get us started. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here um, this evening. My name is Shanita Modlin. Um, I am from Baltimore. Um, I am an effectiveness coach during the school year. Um, and I also support our um, teachers of color um, and our elementary residents. Um, this summer, I am the PST um, director, and so I'm so excited to meet um, our new residents coming into our program this year. Hello, um, my name is Tessa Rose. I am an English teacher in Indianapolis. Um, this is my first year um, in the fellow program, and yeah, I teach high school right now. Good evening, my name is Courtney Walson. I'm from Indianapolis as well. I teach at George Washington High School, Algebra One in the Freshman Academy. And this will be my second year um, in ITF. Hi everyone, um, my name is Daniel Baker, originally from a small town called McMinnville in Oregon, but I live and teach ninth grade English in New Orleans, where I've been teaching for the last 10 years, and then work part-time as a content instructor for Teach NOLA as well. Great, thanks everyone. Um, I promise this is not gonna be a presentation where I'm gonna talk at you guys. We are gonna spend most of our time hearing stories and being in conversation with our panelists, but I did wanna spend just a couple of minutes framing this conversation and just quickly running through the structure of our Teaching Fellows Program. First and foremost, we are student focused. Students need great teachers. And to address that need, we provide effective and affordable pathways into the classroom so that every student has a great teacher. As a former teacher, my is hard, especially when you are new to the profession. But this profession teaching is so critical, especially in this moment in time. And everyone here is in a really special place to enter the classroom and start impacting student lives. You probably wouldn't be here if you didn't think that teaching was important, but you might have some questions about what it looks like and feels like to be an actual teacher, especially to go through this program and be a teacher with TNTP Teaching Fellows. So one of our goals of the event is just to highlight teacher voices, hear directly from these teachers and these coaches um, who have gone through the program and hear about the honest challenges and rewards of being in the classroom. I know everyone on this call is probably at different points in the process, so I'm just gonna quickly review how our program works. First, you get to choose where you wanna teach. We have programs this year in Baltimore, Indianapolis, Nevada, Minnesota, and New Orleans. Then um, you will attend summer training. Over five to, to actually eight weeks, you will um, learn the fundamentals of great teaching. 
You'll learn from expert educators, teach in summer school, and really get that hands-on experience teaching, uh, participate in professional development with your cohort, um, and just really get prepared to enter the classroom. Then you'll secure a teaching position and you will begin teaching this fall um, and immediately start earning a full-time teacher salary with benefits. So we are a really unique program where you are the teacher, you are receiving a salary while you're working to receive your full certification. And then during the um, either one or two years, depending on the length of your program, you will receive personalized coaching and support to make sure that you are an effective teacher um, and ready to impact students' lives. There are so many benefits to TNTP teaching um, fellows, but I did want to just highlight two partnerships. The first is with AmeriCorps. So as a fellow, you may be eligible to enroll in the TNTP AmeriCorps program. So after you complete your first year, you will receive um, an education award, which is a little over $6,000. You cannot apply this to TNTP Academy, but you can use it for any federal student loans. And if you are um, with Indianapolis Teaching Fellows, I know we have a couple ITF alum here, um, that award can be applied to your Marion University tuition. And because ITF is a two-year program, you can actually apply to get this award twice and receive two separate $6,000 um, awards that can both be applied to your Marion tuition. Another benefit of AmeriCorps is that you can actually pause your federal student loans and you will not have to make any federal student loan payments during your year of service. And then after successfully completing that year, AmeriCorps will actually repay any interest that occurred during that time. So that's a huge benefit too, if you have any student loans. The second um, partnership I wanna highlight here is the Black Educators Excellence Cohort. Um, in partnership with a national funder, anyone who identifies in, as Black or African American is eligible for financial aid, as well as testing and um, stipend support. And you will also get to participate in a cohort of other Black educators. All right, so too much talking. I am actually going to stop sharing my screen and we're gonna get to really the, the bulk of the call, which is, um, just, sorry, I am trying to stop sharing. Too many things going on. So I can see all of our lovely panelists' faces. We are going to get to the majority of our call, which is a conversation with our coaches and alumni. Um, and like I mentioned, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A feature and we can get to them as well. All right, so I first would love to just go around and um, hear what brought you to the classroom and what keeps you in the classroom. Shanita, let's start with you. Um, so I definitely um, was that child that taught all of her stuffed animals <laughs> and her doll. Um, I was also that child that just wanted to be the teacher and just wanted to you know, tell everyone all the things. Um, so my love for teaching has been just um, from a child. Um, and then I think that love um, evolved for just a love for children and just intersecting together. Um, and so just being able to have those relationships with children, to see them um, in their aha moments, um, to see them grow, to see them mature, um, has just always been um, a deep rooted love of mine and um, kept me in the classroom. Um, I do want to highlight that I am a 2016 um, Baltimore City um, teaching resident um, alum as well. And um, going through the program definitely um, exposed me um, to my why um, and it kept me grounded in my why. Um, and so that's what brought me to the classroom. That's what kept me. And that's what has now transitioned me to be a coach. I can now um, see more and more brilliant minds and more and more children and affect them um, in the classroom through coaching. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, Tessa Rose, Daniel and Courtney, can we hear about your why? Why did you decide to become a teacher? What brought you into the classroom? No, um, so my family 
Um, starting with my grandmother um, has always been in education. Um, my mother was actually a special education teacher. Um, and growing, of course, like growing up around her, seeing her have the relationships with her students, um, not even just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, um, connecting with the families. Um, it really inspired me um, to become a teacher. So my why now is I love, I love seeing students um, get that aha moment or get build their confidence. Um, a lot of students that come in my classroom, they always tell me like, Miss Watson, I really don't like math. Math is just not my thing. And I always tell them in the beginning of school year, I guarantee you by May, you're going to like something about math. And each year I've, that I've been teaching, I've seen um, students just grow in love mathematics. So that is my why. Um, so yeah. Um, so it's funny, once, once for all of you who are becoming teachers, once you have kids, you'll learn that they are psychic. Um, so one of my students today was like, Mr. Baker, when did you want to become a teacher? Um, and I was like, I'm going to answer this question tonight, so I should prepare. Um, and I wanted to be a teacher since the fourth grade. Um, I come from a small town uh, with a family that has no background in education. I'm the first in all of my extended family to go and graduate from college. Um, and when I was in the fourth grade, went through some rough times and I had two teachers, my fourth grade teacher and a music teacher who really made me feel safe and supported, which I really needed outside of the house. And so as a little kid, I was like, I'm going to be that someday for somebody else. That's what I want to do. Um, that was my why when I first wanted to become a teacher. What I didn't realize is how much that why was going to shift um, and how much students were going to bring to my life and my perspective and growth as a human. Um, and the other reason I stay is that, especially, and we have a lot of panelists for high school teachers, um, but your kids sometimes stay connected with you for life. I've only ever taught ninth grade. Um, and this summer, I'm actually flying out to see one of my first students graduate from college. So it's, it's a lifelong experience that follows you and brings, um, brings experiences that I don't think you can find in almost any other line of work. So that's why I stay in teaching. That's so cool. Um, I, my why, um, I really did not have, um, like mentors or really guidance going through school. Cause I kind of like flew under the radar, um, being kind of quiet and just in the books. Um, so that drew me, um, to the classroom and my background is in leadership. Um, and I wanted to be able to give students those like hands-on skills that I really didn't have. Um, in middle school and high school. I prefer middle school. I love middle school. Um, but I'm trying high school this year. And it's interesting. Um, I feel like I'm more like a middle school person. Um, but yeah, it was interesting to hear the other panelists say that their why has kind of also shifted um, over time because now as I like as we're ending out this year, I'm seeing that part of my why is also helping people, young adults, whatever students fall in love with the process of learning and gaining knowledge, regardless of what knowledge or skill set that is, just like that process of doing something for yourself, doing something on your own for yourself, um, and then like being able to reach back and give it to somebody else. So yeah. Thanks everyone. Um, I love how everyone's answer was a little bit different and how there was this theme of having a teacher themselves impacting them. And I just love that idea of just that intergenerational effect. Um, and it's kind of dominoes. Now you guys are teachers who are impacting students and maybe some of your students will grow up to become teachers. Um, so that's just really special. I don't wanna talk in too many general generalities. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic had such a significant effect on teaching. And I know some of our um, candidates who are interested in teaching, 
might be thinking about how it's going to affect them in the classroom. And I'm sure it varied year to year and we can't predict the future. So we don't know what it's going to look like when they enter the classroom this fall. But how did you navigate teaching or coaching through the pandemic? What was that like for you? Courtney, why don't we start with you? So I was actually, I started ITF um, fall of 2020. So I was literally starting this program, like how am I going to be able to be successful with everything being virtual? Um, so I believe with teachers, you just have to like roll with the punches, I guess. You have to just learn how to adapt with things. Um, and I'm a type of person like, if someone else, if, if I don't know the answer to something, I'm definitely going to make sure that I find someone who has the answers. I always want to make sure I'm giving my students my best. Um, so whatever tools that I need to use to make sure that my students are getting the content that they need, I'm going to make sure that I do that. Um, sometimes it's hard and sometimes you have great days. Um, but you just find ways to just be successful and make sure that your students feel confident and successful in your classroom. Um, the biggest thing that has stuck with me um, has been focusing on the skills that students do have instead of the skills we're trying to remediate or um like bridge the gap with um and also like what Courtney was saying roll with the punches like it's not as deep as we may convince ourselves it is like we have to go online for however long um I wasn't in the 2020 I was in 2021 22 so just learning that there's like tools and gadgets for everything especially to make online learning um more engaging than what you might think it could be. One of the things that um, I really appreciate about our programs with CNTP is that first year support. And so thinking about it from that resident lens, I had my coach in my classroom. I had my coach on speed dial. I, had, I could text my coach. Um, whereas other first year teachers and other programs or just a traditional route didn't have that support. And so I was always thankful for being in that space with TNTP and BCTR. And so now that I am a coach, um, I offer that same support, um, you know, to my residents um, that, I, you know, that I coached during the school year. And so with the pandemic, I, I've coached, you know, pre-pandemic and now, you know, during the pandemic and, you know, I, we're hoping that the pandemic it would be like an after the pandemic, you know, conversation that we can have. But um, one of the things that um, I definitely want to highlight is building those relationships. Um, as a coach, we are um, invested in getting to know our residents as people um, so that their coaching experience can be tailored to what they need. Um, I think the pandemic showed us that, you know, we're people and, and we just need certain things. And while we need that, you know, um, content knowledge and we need, you know, those strategies, I think just, just supporting us as people, we found that that's what we, you know, we needed during the pandemic. And so it's about asking my residents, what do you need today? It's about asking them or telling them, you don't have to tell me what you need. I'm just here to listen. I'm just here to support you. And so building those relationships during the pandemic and having that tailored and unique support to what they need um, and altering my plan for them to make sure that they're taken care of during this time has been, um, I think, a saving grace, you know, um, for my for my residents. Um, and just also just providing options. Um, just, you know, hey, you can, you know, you can log on to session. And if you have to be off video for this session, it's okay. I understand life was happening. Um, but then also having those high expectations, like, you know, I know you can do this. I know it's been rough, but we're going to move past this. And we're, I'm going to coach you through this. And then finally, just extending that grace to self. Um, this is hard work, the, it's, and it's no getting around it, it's hard. Um, but just extending that grace that showing up every day is your first step. And showing up every day for your students and showing that consistency is enough to give you grace to say, you know what, I'm still rocking this out. Even if my content is not as sharp as it could be, 
or even if I had that challenging student that is still giving me a little bit of trouble, I showed up every day for them and they can see me in my classroom, they can see me as a constant factor every day. And they are, you know, in this, this crazy thing called life in this crazy pandemic. I think um, for me with COVID, because I had been teaching for a while before the pandemic hit, um, in, in the strangest of ways, I'm almost grateful for how this has challenged stereotypes of our students. Um, because for people outside of education, um, you will hear like, oh, kids don't want to do school, they're not going to do their homework, blah, 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 you know, all these things about kids not wanting to do this. Um, and even for educators, when we came back and started doing in-person learning, there was this like palpable fear of like, what is going to happen? Like kids have not been in school for over a year, how this is, this is going to be a nightmare. And y'all, this is the best group of kids we have ever had in our entire life. And I think all groups of kids are the best, but this is the kids come. If you're not familiar with New Orleans, um, when water falls out of the sky here, kids don't come to school. Like that's just a thing. And <clears throat> that was before COVID. Now it can be torrential downpour. Every one of my ninth graders is going to find a way inside of the building. They are out writing and out reading years before them. Um, and it just shows like something that at kids actually love and really care about was taken from them without a choice. And now that they have it back, um, they are not willing to give it up. The biggest challenge we have in education right now for COVID are mostly older kids who did give up, who did not come back to high school after the pandemic ended. And that's something that's outside of our control as educators. That is a conversation for other officials to have. Um, but I also think that for some teachers who've been doing the same thing for a really long time, it challenged us um, to adapt. Uh, even for me, after it took COVID, it took an entire pandemic for me to be like, why are my kids only on the computers during testing? Like that makes absolutely no sense. For all of my jobs, teaching and otherwise, everything I do is through a Google Doc or an email or a spreadsheet. And yet I am making 5,000 million copies every single year as kids work on paper, which is not what they're going to be doing as adults. So now everything is still through the computer. I'm in person with the kids. I run class the same way, but everything still is electronic based so that they can become familiar with the platforms they're going to use as adults. Um, so if you're, if you, there's a lot of news out there about how like kids are so far behind because of COVID. If you're reading those and it's stressing you out, or you're thinking like that's going to stop you from the classroom. That's, that's not what we're really seeing in classrooms. Like the kids are there, they are ready to learn. And if you are there for them, they're going to be there for you. Love that. Thank you, everyone. I feel like I'm learning so much <laughs> as a teacher too, but you guys are just speaking my love language. Um, so some of our candidates and some of our fellows are gonna be entering the classroom for the first time. How were you perceived during your first year as a teacher? How did you navigate that first year in particular? Uh, Tessa Rose, why don't we start with you since you are a first year teacher? Um, so this one is really interesting for me because I also taught for a couple years pre-COVID middle school science, and then this is my first year um, in ITF teaching high school English, and I feel like I have to kind of forget everything from middle school because um, it's like high school is a different world. So I guess just being authentic to who you are um, really saves the day, but also prioritizing the relationships with your students. Um, it allows you to see, for me, it allows me to not be as hard on myself because I hear a lot of praise. Um, so I guess that's how I'm seen, but for me, how my students view me is a little bit more valuable for me. Um, so yeah, pouring into those relationships, they really adore authenticity and just being yourself, I've learned. Um, and I guess my instinct was to hurry up and try to get them ready for life, but like 
high schoolers need love too. Um, so yeah, just if you go into that realm, consider that. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. So I also have a strange story when it comes to teaching. So prior to ITF, I actually was teaching in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and I was also teaching middle school. And yes, it is very different from high school. Um, but I do agree with you that you have to just be yourself. Students know when you're pretending. Um, I always like I'm like I believe in being firm, but also giving them love. So um because we're, well, I'm young and going in the classroom with high schoolers <laughs> that are taller than you, they think like, yo, friend. It's like, no, that's not what it is. I'm your teacher. Um, so I always like to just give them like, yes, you, you are gonna follow, you know, the expectations, but I do, I do love you. Um, also my first year um, in ITF, I was able to network with other educators, um, not even in my program, but like in my school that actually were ITF um, alum. And so they helped me with the um, with things because going through this program and teaching prior, like things are totally different. Um, when I was just teaching in Nashville without this program, I really didn't have like a strong foundation of what I wanted to look like as a teacher going through the program um, actually helped me um, with um, getting that foundation for my classroom. And it also helped me like get a voice of, okay, so like, cause I, I'm a very shy person. So I have to like, being a teacher, you have to speak up to get things done. That's just what you have to do. So it helped me actually like get a voice. I think uh, I remember my first, how I was perceived as a teacher very, very well, because it was stated explicitly um, at our first meeting for all new hires at my school. Um, the principal was there, the assistant principals were there, and they were all talking about the school and stuff. And then one of the assistant principals stopped the meeting. She pointed at me and she said, you are not going to make it here. You are too young. You look too nice and you smile too much. And these kids are going to eat you alive is what she said. Um, and it was very awkward for me because I was not ready for this and had no idea what to say. Um, what's funny is she apologized for that six months later and actually became um, one of my closest allies on campus when it came to advocating for kids. Um, so we were both looking at each other from different lenses and then found a way to work together. Um, but uh, depending on if you've taught before, depending on your age, depending on your background, people are going to come with assumptions and biases and ideas about who you are as a person. All, my best advice you can give is just let those roll off your shoulders as much as possible. Know who you are. Um, and people who know who they are typically do very well in their first couple years. Um, and then the other advice I'll give to new teachers is um, don't start your career like me. I'm very lucky I made it past my first two to three years because I was the teacher who did not take care of myself. I was up at two o'clock in the morning planning lesson plans, working all day at school, staying after school for clubs and tutoring, um, making sure kids got home from practices. Like I had no self-care and that's where many new teachers end up leaving because they burn out. This is hard work and you will have to to do hard work if you're going to be a good teacher, but you also have to make sure you take care of yourself. So this is sustainable. So kids not just have high quality educators, but high quality educators that stay. Um, and that's one of the biggest things I think we're working on in the education movement right now is educators who stay for a long period of time. Um, super quick, I will say that my experience, I was the only BCTR teacher in my building. Um, and that came like, you know, with, you know, some heavy weight, um, trying to see what this first year teacher was going to do. Um, and I was definitely the TLAC queen. And you will learn what TLAC is, teach like a champion. I spit, spit out those strategies. Like, I mean, it was every day of what to do direction, 100% you know, strong voice, and you'll learn all those things, you know, during pre-service training, but 
I stuck to those things that I was taught during my program, even when teachers around me were not, and teachers that were teaching for years um, were not doing the same things I was doing. But my students, um, they had, I, they knew that I loved them. They knew I had high expectations for them, and I stayed grounded in being that BCTR resident. I was also the relationship queen. I knew everybody. I knew, I knew the mother, father sister, brother, auntie. I knew my community. Um, I actually walked my community because I wanted to see what my kids saw on the way to school. And so that was something that I did as a first year teacher because I wanted to know just because I was a teacher of color, just because I grew up in Baltimore City and was a product of the, of the school system too, it still did not give me a right to think that my experience was the same as my students. And so I wanted to walk the same streets I wanted to see what they saw on the way to school so that I knew what they had to go, go through to get to me. And so those are things that I, that really held me during my first year, that no matter what, um, what was going on outside of my classroom, I was grounded in my BCTR training and I was grounded in the love and the relationships that I had for my students. Wow, that's great. Definitely hearing this theme of relationships, both with students and with yourself, um, and how important that is to really be grounded as a teacher. I remember that first year, it was so hard. Um, that was one of the hardest years of my life was when I entered the classroom. And we've touched upon this um, a little bit in some of the previous answers, but I think one of the most effective components of our program is that coaching support that you received your first year. So you have this network of support when you enter the classroom. You're not entering by yourself. You're entering with your cohort, with other first-year teachers, um, and you're entering with a coach who is there to make sure that you succeed in the classroom, particularly during that first year. Um, and we've talked about how during that first year, you receive personalized feedback and feedback does sound a little scary. Um, so just wanna, especially to my coaches, Janita and Daniel, what is feedback? How does that work? I guess I'll start. Um, so uh, feedback is definitely something that you will um, get to or, or become appreciative of and you will get used to it. <laughs> So if you if you come in the program and you're like, what is feedback? Oh, I'm not good with someone telling me my glows and my grows. You know, you will learn to appreciate. Um, I will just say quickly that my first year I had my coach and yes, I was getting the feedback. My second year, I didn't receive feedback from my school. And that was, I, I was like, oh, like what's happening? Like I was so used to the feedback that when I didn't get it, I was like, no, this is not right. Like what is life right now? Um, and so with my residents, I always like to start our, co our coaching conversations with just thanking them for doing the work, thanking them for being open to receiving the feedback and implementing the feedback. Um, and then we talk about their strengths. We talk about the things that we want to, you know, keep at it, keep going. This is great. So keep doing this. Don't change it. Okay. Um, and then we move to those areas of opportunities. And notice I say areas of opportunities, not weaknesses, because I don't look at anything that happens as a weakness, but an opportunity to grow. And so we frame it that, look, these are areas of opportunity and these are spaces where there's room to grow and there's room to do something different. Um, and then we practice. Another thing you're gonna practice and you're gonna practice, and you're gonna practice some more. Um, and practicing, I even practice when I facilitate um, my sessions. Practice is, is, a, is a really deep rooted part of being a teacher and it's okay to practice before you before your students get to you. And so um, those are the components of my feedback conversations that I have um, with my residents. Um, but again, being open and willing to implement that feedback um, is definitely a starting point for a resident. Be open to it and you know it will take you far. Yeah, um, so I'm a little bit different. I did not go through Teach NOLA or TNTP. Um, I got my license the traditional way as a student teacher over the course of two years. So when I put those two years together, I've actually been up in front of students for 12. Um, and my first two years teaching in my program, and then my first two years teaching in New Orleans, I never received feedback. 
um, of any kind except for the mandated um, observations that we have to do in our school systems down here. Um, and, and coming to work for Teach NOLA and seeing how coaching works, I am jealous to this day of everybody who has someone to watch them teach and help them grow because not jealous because I wish I could have been a better teacher for those first few years when I was learning how to be good on my own. Um, but because for at least three years, I was, I could have been much better for my students. There's three years of kids that I taught um, that could have had a better teacher if someone was there to help me when I was new. Um, and so just know that when you're receiving feedback, um, it's rather you are good at receiving feedback or it's a difficult conversation for you at the end of the day, um, you're receiving this thing to help you be better for children. Um, and when you look at it through that lens, um, it's a really, really positive growth process for you as an educator. Um, what For teachers that I coach, because I coach teachers on my campus as well, um, I always tell them, because for, for new teachers, this can be really hard sometimes, no one is born into teaching. I have met almost nobody who is just born with like the natural gift to be an educator. This is a learned job and it's not a job that you learn in a day or two. Um, and so having someone help teach you to teach is one of the biggest gifts you can have as an educator. And then you'll really know you got it when you become that person, when you're giving that same feedback to someone who's starting out and be like, oh, I remember what this was like, and you're gonna make it too. So, so just be open. Um, it is a really wonderful process and be glad that you have that feedback because it's much tougher when you don't. Can I add something as a fellow? Just really quick. Absolutely. Go for it. Okay. I really have a, uh, I'm really challenged when it comes to asking for help, but like Ms. Shanita said, the coaches that they set us up with, Mm, mm, mm. they are so tailored to like who you are and what you need and the feedback it doesn't it's not a scary thing it really does kind of allow you to step into your own and and it just sharpens you you know it just refines you a little bit but she she was telling the truth like the the support like is just it truly is the best part and I really don't know what this year would look like if I did not have my coach. So, yeah. I want to add to that as well. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that was has been said. Um, my coach last year, I still have a strong relationship with her, um, Roche. And um, she really helped me last because I'm very hard on myself and I'm a perfectionist and she used to be like Courtney you're learning it's okay and so she used to always just make sure like you know I'm not just overthinking things and labeling myself as a bad teacher um if I didn't have Roche to be honest with you I think last year would have been really difficult um she was the voice that I needed if things were not coming across with other um I don't want to say professors, but other um, individuals in the ITF. Um, she always made sure that my voice was heard. Um, she always, even like, it wasn't even just like in the classroom. She was like, oh, well, how are you doing? Like, I know things are getting tough right now. So how are you really doing? And, you know, you're trying, you don't really like to vent at school. So just venting to her. She's like, I totally understand. She's like, you know, she'll always give me solutions on what, um, what I needed to do. So yes, the coaches are bomb idea. Love the shout outs. Um, we are almost at time. I'll just bring us a couple of minutes over. I do just wanna plug if you have any questions to put it in the chat or the Q and A. Last words of advice for people who are going through the process who might be considering teaching. Um, last words, um, Dana, why don't we start with you and then we'll whip around before we head out. Um, last words. Uh... This, as I said, when I started this job is like no other. Um, and 
if this is something that you're passionate about and want to do and you love kids and want to help kids and be there for them, then do this. Don't let all the other noise. I mean, right now there's so much news published about teaching between COVID and everything else that's going on. Don't let the noise determine your choice. Um, if this is something you want to do, then give yourself the opportunity to experience it because this is, there are no better memories than the things that your kids are going to do in your classroom and then in their lives. Um, one of my former students just spoke to our state Senate about redistricting. Like I watched this in the news. And so it's like these, these things you can't experience unless you're, you're in it. Um, so I hope you all do become teachers. And if you are uh, coming down to New Orleans, maybe I'll get to meet you in person. But thank you all for listening to me tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, two quick things. The first um, is that this is a service-minded career. If you are looking to be served, this is not for you. We are here to serve our children and they deserve our service. So that's, that's one. Having that service-minded um, focus, that service-minded career um, in the forefront of your mind. And the second thing is, is that look at challenges as mountains, okay? And if you look at challenges as mountains, you are the person that will prove that that mountain can be climbed. And sometimes you are the person that was chosen to show that that mountain can be climbed. Um, I am super excited to welcome all of our Baltimore um, city residents um, to us in, um, during the summer. As the PSC director, it is an honor to serve you. Um, this is again, a service-minded career, we serve you. And so I am looking forward to serving you during the summer um, and during the school year um, in Baltimore. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so excited to begin and walk on this journey with you. Um, so teaching is a very rewarding profession. Um, it's not for everyone but individuals that choose this profession, um, individuals that choose this profession, like it's, it's very rewarding. Um, especially being an African-American um, teacher and I'm able to connect with African-American students um, and just minority students in general, um, it always centers me back to, this is why I do this. Um, so if you're looking for a profession where you are, you know, being rewarded for just because like teaching, you're giving all the time, but your students are also giving you things too. You might lose hope in some situations and then your student just out of the blue sends you a message on Schoology. Hey, Miss Watson, I really love that lesson that you taught today. And I thought the lesson was terrible, but just with that little message, it showed me, you know, that I'm actually doing something right. There, I'm touching someone in my classroom. So yes. Um, I would just say to let go of what you think you know, um, because you really do have to be um, willing and able to adapt and um, be that lifelong learner that you want your students to be. Um, but also, while you have the time now, build your support um, to have in place, build your like systems to still take care of you. Because um, like the other panelists said, with it being a service-based career, like you have to refill you and take care of you first. And it's really tricky if you're already like in it to like do that. So prepare as much as you can, but don't, don't over prepare or overthink because you really, it's not, you really can't, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, unfortunately, our time is up. I do want to thank all of our panelists for sharing your wisdom, your insight, your stories, um, your truth about teaching. It has been such a special time. Um, 
I just want to know a couple of things before we head out. If you have not applied yet, we have an upcoming deadline next Tuesday, 2-2-2, February 22nd, Tuesday. Um, that is our February deadline. Please submit your application by then. Um, we, Our partner schools are really excited to start hiring fellows um, and residents, and so I really encourage you to get your application in. I also just want to plug that if you refer family, friends, coworkers, there is a referral bonus. Teaching is more fun when you do it with friends. And so if you have a friend who's interested in teaching, please refer them, drag them along with you. You guys can teach together. And then lastly, uh, connect with us. If any questions came up during the conversation, please reach out and email us. Um, we would love to set up a time to talk about your specific situations. And do you want to plug our socials? We're on Facebook and Instagram. Follow us there. Thank you, everyone. And especially, again, thank you to our panelists. Have a great rest of your night. Bye, everyone.